Oh, she always gives. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All right, I'm going to call the uh, council workshop to order. Um, my name is Mike Little, mayor for the district of North Vancouver. So the pleasure falls to me to welcome everybody here to the uh, council workshop for Monday, February 6th at 5 p.m. Uh, although we're starting a couple of minutes late here. Uh, we do have uh, uh, some uh, slight regrets from Councillor Hansen. He's going to be slightly late. He's coming in from court and he's delayed. Uh, Councillor Back is joining us virtually today. Um, as this meeting is uh, available in a hybrid fashion for staff, council, or for members of the public to participate in. Um, the purpose of a council workshop is an opportunity for council to ask clarifying questions about a particular issue. What happened here is that uh, um, the question about uh, the future 29th was brought forward to a regular meeting of council. We had a discussion, we couldn't reach consensus, and so we referred the matter to a workshop to do our best to um, find a resolution for this space going forward. And so that is the purpose of the meeting tonight. So what you can expect is uh, we're gonna hear a presentation from staff. Uh, Mr. Joyce is gonna lead us off in a moment. Uh, and they have about a 15 minute presentation and, right. and, uh, and then we'll uh, return back to discussion by the group. So at this point, I'm gonna call on Mr. Joyce to introduce the subject. Thank you, Worship. And Mr. Paul, we'll do some introductions. Mr. Carney with the presentation. As you mentioned, it's about 15 minutes. There's two parts to the tonight's presentation. We had some new data, so we thought it was important in the first part to bring all of council back up to speed on the background information when considering East 29th. So the first part is a sort of a, a, a brief overview of our, our, our cycling uh, data and some input. And then the second part of the presentation, we'll drill down onto 29th and council the receipt of a staff report with some recommendations. We'll finalize, finalize our presentation with. Uh, to Peter for a brief opening and then Mr. Carney for the presentation. Just uh, uh, going to actually uh, properly put the agenda on the floor and, uh, and the good idea. floor, if I may. Um, so the agenda has been circulated with the package. Any errors or omissions from the agenda? So None. Moved by Councillor Mears. A second around the matter. Councillor Pope. All the question. All those in favor. Contrary minded. Motion carries. Uh, we have a set of meeting minutes uh, that have been circulated. Uh, this is item 2.1 and the date uh, from uh, the January 16th meeting and any errors or omissions? Hearing none, moved by Councillor Murray, uh, second by Councillor Back. I'll call the question on the matter. All in favor? Contrary minded motion carries. Good. We're on the right side of the law here now. And uh, now I'll return to Mr. Cohen. Thanks, Mayor Little. So uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, nice to be the general manager of Financial Services. I'm joined by Steve Connie, who is the section manager of transportation. I have pause you just there. Can I just check in with uh, Councillor Back? Can you hear Mr. Cohen clearly? Yes, I can hear him fine. Obviously, I can't see him, but I can hear him clearly. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, uh, in terms of this evening's uh, presentation, you know, it helps set the context. Um, I'm sure all of us can appreciate that portions of our transportation network are experiencing some significant pressure right now. Um, and that's really in relation to board on the walls. You know, we have a number of competing demands for a very limited amount of room space. That could be from, from the region we're growing, district, we have local areas that are growing, or even just in terms of our changing demographics and how people are moving around. So, for Steve's first portion of the presentation this evening, he's really going to be walking you through why do we invest in cycling here in the district, uh, in, particularly in that broader regional context. We'll then go through some of the difficult constraints we have on some of our bike lane projects and what's some of the data that we're starting to receive in terms of what's going on with cycling in our community as well. He's then really going to dive into specifically our key item for tonight, which is the East 29th bike lanes. And that's just one of the examples in our community where we do have that limited road space available with the number of competing demands. So without further delay, I'll hand over to Steve to walk through the presentation. Oh, thank you, Peter and Gavin. And uh, good evening, um, Mayor and members of Council. Um, as mentioned, tonight uh, in tonight's presentation, we'll look both at the broader topic of uh, cycling uh, and then focusing in on uh, East 29th Street. And really the, 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 the key objective of tonight is to have a discussion around you know, how we can best uh, balance the, the needs around accessibility and also ensuring you know, at the same time we, we maintain a high level of uh, safety along 29th. So why do we invest in cycling? Uh, well, a quick review of why cities invest in cycling. 
Um, it is considerably less expensive uh, than road widening. A cycling infrastructure uh, can often be added without the need for property acquisition or major services. Uh, and it is a more efficient use of space and energy to move people. Uh, and so helps to reduce the carbon footprint of cities. Uh, the following is a passage from a letter received by the Vancouver Coastal Health Medical Health Officer in advance of the workshop tonight. I quote, healthy communities are places that are safe, contribute to a high quality of life <coughs> by offering access to a wide range of health promoting amenities and infrastructure. There are significant quality of life, health, safety, and economic benefits associated with investing in active transportation. Active transportation promotes physical activity, reduces obesity, enhances social connections, and decreases pedestrian and cyclist injuries, resulting in improved physical and mental well being in the community. Well, that sums it up nicely in terms of why we invest in cycling. Uh, regional context um, it is estimated that we can expect to see over a million new people in the region by the year 2050. And so there is a growing need to improve our ability to move people around the region. Uh, it's important to remember that transit trips are often linked with walking and cycling. And so a robust, a robust active transportation network can help to ensure a successful transit, a transit system. And this is partly why TransLink it provides uh, grant funding to municipalities to invest in cycling and walking projects. Uh, cycling along with walking and, and, and transit is referenced in many of the uh, district's plans and policies. Um, cycling not only helps to address our transportation goals, but also helps to address climate action, resiliency, housing, and equity goals. As demonstrated in the OCP action plan, uh, these issues are to varying degrees uh, interrelated. Uh, we know that cycling alone will not enable us to reach these goals, but is part of a multi-pronged approach to get us there. The council direction received to date has been largely related to prioritizing routes uh, between town and village centers, uh, connecting these population centers uh, to high use parks and to the Burrard Inlet bridges. Uh, this is also um, consistent with the hub uh, stated priorities, which is the local cycling um, advocacy group. Uh, direction has been, uh, direction received has been to consider um, repurposing space from on street parking on materials as a cost effective method for delivering safe and desirable connections. Uh, in addition to council's guidance, uh, staff also uh, consider land use, neighborhood design, connectivity, completeness, comfort, topography, uh, coordination with neighboring municipalities, and integration with transit in our recommendations. Uh, when it comes to cycling, uh, people generally fall into one of three categories. Uh, you know, as engineers, we like to categorize things. We have people. Um, so there's sort of a spectrum here, but broadly speaking, you know, in categories, there are the, the interested but concerned uh, group on the left, um, somewhere in the, in the range of 40 to 60%. There's the enthusiastic and confident group uh, in the middle, and then we have the strong and fearless, which is a relatively small percentage of the population. Uh, we know that somewhere between 25% and 40% of people really have no interest in cycling. Um, however, that does mean that there's a large percentage of the population that would regularly cycle with safe and comfortable facilities that are in place. In order to meet the or achieve the OCP targets around mode share, uh, which is 35% by the year 2030, approaching, uh, we need to attract the demographic that requires dedicated facilities. Our current cycling mode share, which is around 2%, so a pretty small uh, percentage, uh, really is representative of the strong and fearless demographic. Mr. Carney, can I just ask so I don't have to write down what you mean? Can we get that this slide presentation? Yes, absolutely. Yes. I believe it has been circulated. Yeah, if not, we'll get it all to council. We'll, we'll, we'll make sure every, everyone receives it. Thank you. Uh, vehicle speeds and volumes are important considerations when planning cycling facilities. As speeds and volumes increase, there is a greater need for dedicated and protected facilities. Uh, this is particularly relevant along the arterial roads. 
where traffic volumes can approach 10,000 vehicles a day. Uh, cycling facilities can range from shared streets uh, to protected cycling tracks or bike, bike paths. Um, so again, it's really a range here, sort of a spectrum. Uh, from, say, on the, on the left-hand side, um, being uh, more formal, or lower volume, lower uh, speed roadways, whereas as you move towards the left, uh, there's a strong Shared facilities typically have a 30 kilometer an hour uh, posted speed and, and volumes of less than 2,000 vehicles a day, which is generally kind of a local road environment. Whereas for the higher volume roads with speeds of 50 to 60 kilometers an hour, uh, dedicated and buffered bike lanes, multi use paths, or protected cycling tracks are recommended. And so they are the collectors and arterial roads would fall into this category. Uh, in consideration of, of network planning, uh, we look at a number of factors, including land use, uh, connectivity, so building out the network, uh, completeness, directiveness, uh, comfort, and integration with transit and walking facilities. Uh, staff do look for viable routes along parallel lower volume roads. Uh, so an example of this is we recently did have made some improvements to West 15th Street, uh, which was is really an alternative to Marine Drive, so one block to the south and, and parallel. Uh, however, in some cases, uh, there really are, are, are no um, competitive parallel alternatives, uh, such as uh, in Valley Road, where there's like I say, really no direct and parallel alternative to, to the arterial road. And of course, topography on the North Shore is a significant challenge for cyclists, uh, although the emergence of e-bikes in recent years does offer some reprieve on um, well, I'll get into a little bit more on some of the trends we're seeing in e-bikes, but uh, it, it's growing quickly. Uh, once a preferred route or alignment is selected, uh, we then need to consider a number of technical factors. Uh, these could include uh, budgets, property constraints, traffic and transit needs, parking, operational requirements, including the need for solid waste collection, presence of driveways, utilities, etc., all while ensuring a high level of safety for users. And so what is the data telling us? Uh, well, in 2020, we, we completed a, a fairly comprehensive district-wide cycling survey, uh, which told us that um, uh, providing separation between cyclists and motorists is critical to empower 40 to 60 percent of the interested but concerned demographic to take up cycling. And so there's an incredible potential to increase our cycling mode share if we can deliver on this infrastructure. Also, there is considerable potential to convert motor vehicle trips to active modes in the district. Uh, and by this, we mean those relatively short uh, trips that people are used to, currently uh, are using cars to, to, to make. Those can be, you know, have the potential to be converted to, to either biking or, or walking trips. And based on the results of the North Shore Travel Survey, up to 40% of these short trips in the district could be completed by cycling. Again, in combination with appropriate infrastructure. So we, uh, we tap into some of the Stra Strava and, and Lime data. Lime is the company that um, is the vendor for the e-bike share program that we have in partnership with the city and, and West Vancouver. Um, yeah, some of this data is really good. It, it offers insights into hourly, daily, seasonal variations in cycling, uh, as well as uh, the increasing proportion of e-bike trips. Uh, what we've seen is that every year since 2019, both commuter and recreational e-bike trips have really been uh, increasing. Um, over 15,000 Strava users logged over 153,000 uh, trips in 2022. Uh, which is more than 45,000 more trips than in 2018. So definitely, uh, definitely growing in scale. Um, overall, Lime riders have clocked over 230,000 kilometers on the North Shore uh, in the two-year North Shore e-bike share pilot program, uh, which represents about five trips around the equator. 
So uh, that's why we have five, actually five and a half. So we have five and a half globes here. On the left. <laughs> that's quite a distance. I'm sorry, what's a Strava again? Well, Strava is an app that you sign up for and then you can, you can register, uh, track your, your kilometers, oh. whether you trail run or hike or bike or road bike. So it's, a, it's, it's quite popular. It shows it you the map too, where you've been. Yeah, it's quite neat actually because they also produce heat maps and you, so you can see uh, geographically where people are cycling. And it's kind of a proxy for total volumes because not everybody's in Strava, uh, but it gives a good indication as to where people are cycling. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's quite revealing. So uh, recap, uh, in summary, cycling delivers the greatest benefit for the lowest cost. Uh, separation is really important to a lot of people. To, to both to maximize safety and, and encourage ridership. Um, uh, because of the types of trips we make here in the district, like I say, usually fairly short, short uh, distance trips, uh, there's a big potential to uh, convert some of these auto trips to cycling. Uh, and e-bikes, we do recognize that e-bikes are a big part of the solution uh, given, given our topography here on the North Shore. And so with that, I'd like to shift our focus now to the East 29th Street uh, safety and mobility project. See if maybe we should stop there if there's any questions from council on just general around cycling in the community and then we can move on to 29th. Thank you, Mary. I know we're talking about, um, through, well, through the budget, uh, the Spirit Trail. And I'm just wondering um, where, the, uh, where the connection is between Metro Vancouver's uh, Greenway project in the Seymour especially, because that's where we need to complete a significant um, piece of the trail. And, um, and us, because I think our routing was different, um, certainly in the far Eastern part of the Seymour than uh, Metro Vancouver's Greenway um, plan. And I think um, I've spoken to Mr. Cohen about that low hanging fruit and some of those connections that we could complete sooner than later. Um, but, you know, Metro's looking at this greenway, um, you know, they're wanting to look at, you know, um, moving on a lot of those connections. So can you just update me as to where we are in talks with them? I've sort of heard their plan on the North West Committee, but I think there would be some ability for us to share some of those those uh, connections. Yeah, sure. So I, I can answer that particular question. More information is going to be coming to council because it was a big topic discussion in the last time. So in terms of the spirit, it was. In terms of the spirit trail uh, piece, we're providing more information to council as it relates to what our twenty twenty three plan is. Um, in the budget, there is proposed to be uh, two hundred thousand dollars set aside to progress some of the planning works. And similar to what you were saying, councillor, you know, given the current economic climate, let's look at quick wins, quick to implement opportunities back to council uh, at a future time in terms of what that looks like. That work would also include meeting with partners. So it would include Metro Vancouver, it would include uh, some, some local residents um, and, and others such as, you know, uh, Stableton Commission uh, going through their reserve as well. So there is a, a bit more work we need to do. Um, the key piece of the puzzle is you know, funds for us to be able to progress that work. Sorry, a key piece of the puzzle is what? So in, in terms of uh, the key piece of the puzzle there is that part of the 2020 capital would identify an allocation of funds to progress the planning, design, and engagement work. Right. Thanks. Sorry. Hearing impairment. Sorry, it's probably the old head. But um, we have been working with Metro on the Greenway plan for Seymour, right? Off and on. Okay. So I think it would behoove us to sit down and see what they're looking at, what makes sense and what doesn't for their alignment. And our alignment, because I know you and I living in the Seymour and Councillor Hampson as well, we know that area very well. And there are some connections that make a lot of sense. And then there's others that are a little bit, well, you're a little bit. your earlier slides just on our network? We have done a tremendous work. A lot of those in the west keep going back, western part of the municipality. And you'll remember this from Mr. Ono as well. Like there's a big dotted line there. From the bridgehead to Deep Cove, and that work still needs to be ongoing. And it, and you heard the mayor speak last week as well. It's just not for the engineering department. There's still some consultation with our partners. There's some discussions with the First Nations. 
to settle on what we're doing needs to see more. So I think it would be a good idea to look at that low hanging fruit that Colin talked about, and then that sort of longer term vision so we can see what we can do in the short term, medium term, long term, what Metro's doing. And, um, and then there are some connections through BC Parks land as well, right? And we could talk to the province um, about that because there is so many available. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, you mentioned about uh, e-bikes. I, I think there can be a game changer. Do you have any uh, stats on the pricing of e-bikes in, in the last couple of years? Or are they dropping down quite uh, quickly? Or I, I think I think they are. I, I mean, I think there's there's like with anything, there's a fairly big range. Um, but I, I think the price, like the entry level of pricing, is, is definitely dropping. Do you know what that is, right now, roughly? Um, you wanting to buy one, Herman? I think they're all over the map, Herman. Yeah, there's a big range. I'm going to say anywhere from from one thousand to ten thousand. But I think you can probably get a good one these days for between two and three thousand. Uh, so it's not much different from you know from a regular, reasonably quality. I didn't. I didn't mean to tease you. I'm sorry. I, I'm just. It's on my list to buy an e-bike this year, and so that's why I was wondering if you were having the same on the same track as. Trying to look at the affordability issue, but I'm also looking at the e-bike myself. Councilor Mary, an additional. Just um. So Metro Vancouver Parks Committee has been talking for a number of years, um, and these are concerns coming from around the region, in regards to uh, multi-use paths in our parks. And um, it's becoming more and more evident that the multi-use parks or the multi-use trails can be challenging, um, especially in very busy parks, because there's so many different types of users. And, you know, we throw in the electric bike, right, which is a, another, there's another host of challenges with them. Um, you know, especially in, in our forests in the summer when it's very dry and there can be hazards associated um, with electric vehicles in park systems. So we have to be careful about that. But I guess, um, you know, I, when we come, come back to talk about our uh, bicycle master plan um, and our pedestrian master plan at those subsequent workshops, I think it's important to sort of talk about how you're gonna manage all of these different users. You know, there was one time in our trail system, horses, runners, and, and hikers, and now there are still horses. There are those in there. In the Seymour, there are horses in Lynn. Um, uh, but now we've got, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of different bikes, and they're not just um, mountain bikes anymore. They're, um, you know, there are different um, bikes that are being used to access the forest. There's electric bikes. People are in there with electric bikes. There's dog walkers. There's, you know, runners. There's people. There's um, whole hiking groups of, you know, 50 to 100 people. Um, you know, one group was coming down the Lynn the other day. Um, a very large uh, tour group. So, how are we going to look at these trail systems? How are we going to look at these connected bike systems and those that go from an, a sort of an urban trail into a forest trail and then out again back into a, you know, a, a neighborhood? Um, how is that all going to work as far as all of those different users? Um, and I, again, I, I want us to, you know, work more closely um, with Metro Vancouver because they're doing a lot of this work already. We did the um, park pilot or the parking um, pilot with them. And I think that worked out really well. We shared some resources. We shared uh, information with one another. And I think um, as they begin to study multi-use trails and how they're going to look at, um, you know, separating some of them in high use areas, I think it would behoove us to, you know, be part of those conversations at a greater level than we're at now. Yeah. No, that's a great question and really good observation. I think that, like you say, in, in higher use areas where you've got high volumes of both pedestrians and cyclists, um, best practice is to separate them and, and to not have multi-use paths. Multi-use paths have their place, you know, if you're constrained for right away or the volumes are a little bit lower or a combination of both. Um, but if in you know, in areas where the volumes are high, the, like I say, best practice is to, is to separate. Them. 
I think one example for us to look at and maybe study as to what is happening in the district, because we do have these areas of, you know, densification, but they are framed by a sort of a natural background forest, right, is um, coming out at the top of um, Lynn Valley Road at the end of the line, um, you know, you can cut down into into river and be down a mountain highway in minutes, um, you know, from one area across the river to another. And uh, so it's sort of a forested area or a neighborhood area into a, a very large dog walking area and outdoor area, then into a very dense um, town center in, in Lower Lynn. So, you know, I think, I think um, I'd be really interested in, in knowing where the riders are going versus where we think they should go where are they actually going and what infrastructure are they using to get from point A to point B? I think this is an important conversation. We, you know, we're going to lead into revising the uh, bicycle master, bike master plan in our, um, in our community. But we um, can really have all of the resources tonight. For, no, I know. It's for, just for that issue. when I remember, I have to say something, otherwise I'll forget. I have uh, <laughs> Mr. Joyce wishing to add his comments and then Councillor Back as well. So. I would, because that is a whole other separate evening. But there is groups, Councillor Marie, working on that. It would be nice if there's consistency across not just the lower mainland, but the province, the Cape yeah. Water Trail. You see massive different types of e bikes, some of them almost like small motorcycles. So there's Various park user groups in, in the region looking at what should be both in the province, metro lands, and, 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 and the North Shore. Like we have that working group with Metro across the North Shore. And so there'll be some consistency in what we're using. And you're right, the, the number of users now has just taken us into a higher level of what trails, but that is almost a separate evening into itself. Okay. I'll look forward to that evening. Councillor Back, your comments? Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I definitely hear the conversation that's happening around multi-use paths and different types of users and, and making sure that there's uh, separation where possible. Um, I wanted to go back to Councillor Murray's comments about the dry summer forests and e-bikes. Can you expand on that, Councillor Murray? I wasn't sure what what you were uh, alluding well, to as it challenges oh, it. I, I I don't, I think it's just something that we have, yeah, I just think we have to keep in mind when we're putting electric things into a forest, like Metro actually had a, um, a situation, well, for many, many years, um, over um, by Valcara, um, a motorcycle group was using areas within a Metro park um, to bring their motorcycles in. And we, we do have areas in the, in the, um, well, in the Seymour, like the sand pits, for instance, you'll have uh, ATVs um, over the years have gone in there, um, you know, to, to ride. And so whenever you're putting something electric into a very, very dry forest, you know, it's, you got to be careful, right? And you don't want to, uh, you want to make sure that, you know, you're, you're not causing anything that you don't want to happen. So it's just the concern of, you know, um, you know, electric things being in dry forests. Yeah, forest fires. Well, and also if, if you don't have hard surface mm -hmm. the erosion that comes along with high torque totally. vehicles um, in those areas. But the mm -hmm. And the forests are very, um, they're very challenged right now. Thanks. I just wanted that comment clarified because to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's been any um, forest fires caused by any e-bikes. Um, I just don't want Oh, that. no, I'm not uh, suggesting that, yeah. Councillor Back. I'm just saying anything that is going into our forest that, you know, of any kind, even, you know, people can create forest fires. So it's just another thing to be cautious of. Um, I just wanted to talk about uh, mode share for a second. Mr. Carney, I wonder if you could um, maybe go back to the slide that talked about the biggest opportunity for increasing mode share in terms of reaching. Yeah. So you can see e-bike trips increased from one and a half to 4.2. Um, I believe it's our good uh, goals within our OCP are to change mode share to 30%, uh, to reach 30% of all uh, trips by active modes by 2030. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that and if that is still a reasonable goal at this point. Uh, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Council Back. Uh, this one here is, is really the proportion of e-bike trips, um, of, of, of cycling trips. Um, so right. not suggesting a, a 4.2%. Not, not a mode shift, it's representative of 
a uh, proportion of the cycling trips. You yes. have another one for mode shift. Yeah, yeah. there was one, and, and I think I mentioned, um, yeah, here we are. So the mode share for cycling is between 1.5 and 2.6. Yeah. And so this has been, um, you know, obviously we'd like to see that number higher. Um, we're, we're still seeing, um, and I, forgive me, I don't have the data in front of me, but I think the auto trip, auto trip still represent close to 80%. It's between 75 and 80% of, of total mode share. Uh, so it's still a big number. Um, and of course, you know, we're, we're you know, our, 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 our aim is to, you know, hit that, um, you know, 35% sustainable uh, mode share by mm -hmm. the year 2030. So we're, we got a bit of work to do, but yeah, mode share for cycling is still sort of in the range of, you know, one and a half to two and a half percent. Right. I think it just represents the opportunity to, um, you know, get more people cycling who are not feeling safe. And I think that's what we heard through the uh, most recent survey that was done um, is that, you know, so, so many people, they, they want to be able to do those daily trips and the ones that are most likely to the, the types of trips that can uh, be done via active transportation most easily, but they're not feeling safe, right? Um, so I think that's where the opportunity is to connect bike routes and make sure that we've got safe safe facilities for people. I've got uh, Mr. Joyce, we should add your comment. Just, Councillor Back, just to add, I mean, it'd be a lagging statistic is what we hear is until you build out the connections between the town centers, you're not yeah. going to build that. So we hear that over and over. Give us yeah. something that works. If you make those connections to connect the town centers, then you'll see that number move. And I think to hit our 30% target with rapid bus and the things we do with transit have to come along as well to make that achievable as a 30% target. Right. There's no question that connecting the town centers has to be, uh, those have to be the routes that are prioritized. I know um, in speaking with Hub that Lynn Valley Center to Lynn Creek is, is one of their top three priorities. Um, along with uh, Spirit Trail and uh, and Main Street, uh, the area around the Second Narrows. Can I just uh, you say do we do we have statistics on uh, like obviously Vancouver went through a significant expansion in bike lanes about uh, ten years ago. Um, do we have any statistics to show mode shift across all of Vancouver? Um, like metro or just the no, city? No, no, the city just the city of Vancouver. Yeah. But hand, we could get those for council. We might have we, we might have some here. Peter's just looking through some of the uh, that's a dedicated separated protected in the downtown core and dedicated separated for through uh, much of the outer areas. Um, but um, so it's not like a perfect example, but I'm just does it yeah, actually, you see a sizable increase in in the mode shift, and uh, um, and if not, why not? Well, we are actually. The good news is that um, a city of Vancouver case study showed uh, a one percent cycling mode share in nineteen ninety four. In two thousand and eight, that was still higher, three percent. But by twenty nineteen, their cycling mode share was nine percent, and. and what they're saying is that you know this is really the result of you know, really almost a couple of decades of investing in cycling infrastructure. Um, so, uh, 2009, this is when the city began constructing the downtown uh, network of protected bike lanes. Um, but you know, prior to that, they were you know using um, you know bu building up uh, uh, bikeways through neighborhoods and uh, so forth. So, so they're seeing success. Um, they've been at this, you know, for longer than we have, um, but I think they're, um, you know, they're starting to see some of the, uh, the rewards from, like I say, co close to a couple of decades of investment in transportation. Is that, I'll just ask a question on that follow-up. Is, is that, um, is that shift, um, like it's, the, sh the shift happens, but is it weather dependent? Does the shift change depending on the time of year? Like in the winter, does the it would can one assume that it drops? <laughs> in the summer, it obviously picks up, so that it goes like this. It does, yeah, it right. does. And and um, and there is we do have a data. I don't have a slide on it, but we do have data um, that shows some of the seasonal variations. Right. It doesn't drop to zero in the winter, but it's definitely lower than what you know what you see in the spring and the summer. Right. Yeah. I think those things are all good for discussion when you bring it back. Right. Well, a lot goes in, including just your population, your age. That's why 
the bike routes are between your town centers because you're going to have different types of people right. in those different town demographics. centers than you do in all your single family neighborhoods. Yes. So that where where the priority was was to connect the town centers. Can I just reiterate uh, what Mr. Carney has said? I'm on the City of Vancouver website and uh, regarding their bike lanes, and it says nearly nine percent of all trips and over thirteen percent of commuter trips in Vancouver are by bike. And that exceeds the city's 2020 target of 7% and on track to achieve the 2040 target of 12%. It just really goes to show that, you know, with the right infrastructure, you can really uh, build up uh, a lot more people making use of yeah. cycling. Yeah, you know, and cities around the world uh, are really seeing a, a major shift towards uh, sustainable roads. Uh, uh, so it's, you know, it's 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 been done. We're not we're not uh, uh, reinventing the wheel. Reinventing the wheel. When there, all the data is there. There's certainly a correlation between cycling mode share and 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 and, and good cycling infrastructure. There's no question about it. So. And I think one of the other things in North End that we're dealing with is that um, is sort of the attitude that it's like having bike lanes is like an extra feature somehow that it's like kind of a, uh, as you called it before, um, the nice to have category when actually um, I've received letters and maybe you have too from many families in our district who are now totally dependent on their bikes. Why? Because of the affordability crisis that we have here in the district. So their family takes their kids to school on their bikes, takes their kids to daycare on their bikes, and that's how they get around. Um, or they've gone down from two cars to one car uh, to make ends meet and are now more into their cycling. It's interesting. Okay. Can we move on to 29 specific? Yes. And, uh, and yes, uh, Herman, you and I were chatting earlier today, and I chatted with Gavin. Uh, the, um, the sidewalks are actually in in the city of North Van, and we did that under an agreement with the city. So that was uh, a question you asked earlier today, and I didn't get a chance to get back to you. Yeah, just confirm that with Steve as well. Okay, good. Yes, so back to uh, um, so in terms of policy uh, direction, etc. Um, the East 29th Street project aligns with a number of policy documents and strategic plans uh, and was designed to improve uh, the safety and, and efficiency of all users. Uh, so transit, walking, cycling, and auto users. Um, the project uh, included new sidewalks, uh, crosswalks with pedestrian activated lights, a new, a new traffic signal at, at William, uh, left turn lanes, and buffered uh, cycling lanes in both directions. And by buffer, I mean space between the cycling lane and the vehicle traveling. Um, one interesting uh, uh, stat too is that of the total project cost, um, uh, the cost related directly to cycling uh, were in the order of 10%. Um, however, I should say that you know a big part of the costs were uh, paving and the, and the traffic signal. But you know it's, I think it's worth pointing out that the, the cycling component uh, was a relatively small percentage of the total. Um, in terms of project background, um, initial planning and consultation on this project began in 2016. And so this has really been, it's been a multi-year process of engagement, consultation, planning, design, construction, and monitoring. Uh, phase one, which is top of the hill at Regent to Lynn Valley Road. Uh, this was delivered in 2019. Um, substantially delivered, a little bit of uh, finalizing. Spring of 2020, but for the most part was completed in 2019. And the city of North Vancouver, uh, as far as we know, planned to construct the western portion, so region to Lonsdale, uh, this year. And so we've been involved in doing design reviews, and we understand that that's uh, in the books for this year. Uh, in terms of street characteristics, uh, it's a major arterial, almost 10,000 vehicles a day, about 9,500. Um, it's a transit route, a bike route, a school route with Boundary Elementary. Um, there's about roughly 50 bikes a day. So some years are, depending on the time of year, this is based on spring 2020. Um, uh, this 
uh, interestingly, this, the speed uh, data shows that the speeds have dropped by about seven kilometers per hour on average in both directions. And the reason I included this was because initially before the project was built, we had people concerned that with the, the traffic signal is going to re result in increased speeds, but in fact, speeds have dropped. Uh, because you know, part of it was we took out the climbing the climbing lane, which I think um, encouraged uh, unsafe passing. Um, collisions have also been reduced uh, since the completion of the project. Based on limited data, we don't have obviously um, uh, ten years or even five years worth of data. But what, what we do have shows a decrease in. So, in terms of the current form. Uh, this is it. Um, this is the section, at least between William and, and uh, Moon Valley Road. Uh, so we do have a parking pocket here on the north side between Flow and Moon Valley Road. And this was um, constructed because the existing curb to curb width allowed us to, to keep that in there. And so we did. And so the cycling uh, lane goes behind the parking. And so the parking actually acts as uh, a bit of a buffer or protection between the travel lane and the bike lane. Um, but what we have heard is that there's a desire for more short-term parking, um, you know, laneway accessibility, and uh, improved solid waste collection and, and uh, recycling uh, collection just through improved efficiency in terms of vehicles being able to, to pull to the curb to uh, do the collection and at the same time enable uh, vehicles to, to continue moving in the travel lanes. So in response um, to what we've heard and you know uh, you know input from the community and, and others um, around accessibility um, what we are proposing is parking pockets, one on the north side, one on the south side. Um, the reason that the south side is larger is because we have um, just a whole number of constraints, including uh, driveways, catch basins, utility poles, um, whereas on the north side we have uh, less, we have similar constraints um, and less room within those constraints. And so this is the sort of the, the configuration that we would allow us to maximize on-street parking through the construction of parking pockets. Um, elsewhere on the corridor, there's really too many driveways for it to be feasible. The reason that this is possible here is because between St. Christopher's and Frome, there are laneways on, on, on the north side and the south side. And so, um, so with the laneways, we have sections where there's no driveways. Um, parking pockets are a great tool to enable the bike lanes to remain continuous and protected from traffic where some limited parking supply is needed. Um, again, technically feasible in, in a couple of locations such as these, uh, given the constraints. Uh, a multi-use path concept on one side uh, does not work for a variety of reasons, including space constraints, presence of driveways, topography, utilities. Uh, etc. And also, two-way cycling facilities are not recommended where there are numerous driveways, uh, purely for sightline-related uh, safety reasons uh, in combination with driver expectations. So when you're pulling out of your driveway, you just you're not expecting cyclists to be crossing your driveway from both directions at speed, and so not best practices and not recommended. In addition to parking pockets, uh, uh, we are also recommending um, the replacement of the plastic delineator posts with precast concrete barrier assemblies. And so, you know, active transportation is an evolving practice. Uh, and as we continue to work in this area, there's new innovative ideas and treatments that emerge. Um, and we found this one, which uh, these photos here are from Moon Valley Road. This uh, is a solution I think that, you know, it really finds that right balance between these competing constraints. And so what it does or what it can do is when these barriers are placed in the appropriate or strategic locations, uh, such as areas where you have higher, higher conflict zones near intersections, for example, 
um, uh, they can really help to, to protect cyclists and bring greater awareness to the bike lanes, but at the same time, uh, enable cyclists to pull up to the curb, do the collection, and pull out and, and maintain that efficient flow of traffic along the arterial. So again, we're trying to balance you know, all these competing interests, and we feel like this is, this is a really good solution, particularly on corridors where you do have a lot of driveways. Get how it works for the garbage, how it works better for the garbage trucks in this. I don't, I'm not getting, when you say pull up to the curb, do you mean pull into the bike lane? Yeah. Oh. So they would temporarily pull up to the curb into the bike lane. Oh. Uh, to do the collection. Is that best practices? Well, it's, again, like, there's a lot of competing um, uh, uh, interests or, or objectives. And so what we're finding, and, and some of the, you know, having the, um, the collection, uh, you know, like the garbage truck, uh, stop in the travel lane on busier arterials can actually create its own set of safety concerns. Yeah. Because now, and what we've experienced is that some drivers are so impatient, they're making unsafe maneuvers to pass. And so we're trying to manage that <coughs> outcome of, the delineated posts. So there's a number of competing things and what we're trying to do is maximize overall safety. I think, you know, with, with the collection, it's once a week and it's, you know, it's the, the amount of time they spend on a corridor is really only a couple of minutes yeah. per week. Yeah. And so I think it's a, it's a reasonable balance between that and, you know, and other traffic uh, safety concerns that can emerge. What do impatient drivers do on side streets when the garbage trucks are? They don't have the option to pass. Exactly. Yeah, they don't have the option to pass. So they're stuck. But the, the, with the risk being that if, if you block the traffic on 29th, it'll go to Shakespeare. And so now you've got cars rat running through the neighborhood because you haven't given them an option mm -hmm. to go through the 29th. And so that's, that's the we went through that exercise and we talked about the stop signs along 29th because that's the natural overflow as people head north to Shakespeare to, to avoid the town center. Mr. Joyce, you had an addition? I think Steve Clark covered it well. I would just add, it's just not the vehicles. You have our solid waste workers hopping off the back of those vehicles yeah. as well in, in traffic. So someone's trying to cut around and I've seen it firsthand on 29th. So it's a small portion of the week as Steve alludes to. So this would allow the solid waste vehicle to pull into a safer environment uh, as uh, so our employees when they jump off the vehicle. To... And then do the cyclists have to go out into the traffic to get around them? Or where do the cyclists go when the, well, when the garbage truck pulls over to the curb lane? They would have the option to, to wait behind the vehicle right. or, you know, if it was safe to pass, they, they, they would have that option. Cars wait. Well, they can walk, they can get off the bike and walk past the sidewalk. I've seen it's once a week and we can't, yeah, yes. all, right. every, every single opportunity. Yeah. I mean, it's really all, it's only for a few minutes per week. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and we've been working with uh, Solid Waste to try and, you know, um, uh, you know it, around scheduling so that the collection is not during the busiest times of the week. And oh, we're excellent. To, we're trying to, you know, coordinate yeah. that way. Um, or after school, like at three o'clock. Yeah, exactly. so, so we've been in close coordination. They, they support uh, this concept. Um, and like I said, I think it's a, uh, on Lynn Valley Road, it's been working well. The other nice thing about these barriers is that they simply sit on top of the asphalt. So they're, it's quite flexible in terms of you can add, you can move, you can take away, you can, you know, you're, you've got some, you know, as you monitor it, you feel that, you know, the section can be a little longer, another, you know, area is like flexible that way. And why do the delineators um, need to come down? Really to, to enable that solid waste, the efficient, safe solid waste collection. Got uh, councillors Forbes and Ma. Councillor Forbes. I'll follow up first on the conversation about the garbage trucks. When you, when there's just been a, you're suggesting two pull outs or pull ins on 29th, and one of them is going to be as large as five to six parking spaces. Um, how does that affect the garbage collection? Because it's an automated pickup, the garbage cans and dump them in the truck. So how is that going to affect them when you've got a 
parking space for five or six spaces that could be occupied. Um, Kevin, you want to? <laughs> you know more about solid waste collection. Than uh, again, it's, it's it's just minimizing risk. You're correct. I mean, you now have a situation where if we create parking pockets, you have a vehicle that pulls alongside that. Uh, but that happens with our garbage fellows with for parking locations on other streets, local streets. Uh, they're pretty adept at, at moving around that. Uh, but it's not a perfect scenario. There's it's got to be some give and take. So if they can't pull into the parking pocket, right. what will happen? Will the fellow jump off, go grab the garbage container, and pull it, wheel it around the back or the front, whatever the importance may be, whether it's a car or a hedge or what have you. Our guys are sometimes they go into the backyard, as you know, with service and. If somebody can't get their container to the front, uh, they can register that with us. So there's all sorts of ways. And then they would bring it to semi semi automatic, it's a semi automatic lift that will yeah. lift it back. Thank you. Um, can you define what short term parking you mean in these parking spaces? Um, short term, I would describe as probably like 30 minutes or less. Uh, on the Lynn Valley Road, um, the I believe the parking pockets on Lynn Valley Road are. Half is 30 minute maximum, and then the other half is unrestricted. And so what we're doing is we're just monitoring that. And, you know, we have the ability to, you know, if we find that um, we need more short-term parking, we can ex expand the, the number of spaces that are regulated that way. Um, we can change, you know, we could change it to one hour or two hours or even 15 minutes. So it's, you know, it's something we can monitor and adjust it. I think that on, on, if, we, if we pursue this, I think we would probably start with 30 minutes and then do, I would say, at least half of the spaces as, as short term and maybe more. I do 100% of the spaces as short term. I I think that's just, the desire. I would suggest that this report is written in a way that emphasizes um, the cycling community and adjacent property uh, owners wanting on-street parking. And what I heard from the owners on 29th, mainly, is they also have a need for services and not just delivery services, like health services. When you have someone coming and it's they're gonna be there for an hour, maybe an hour and a half for two hours. So I would suggest that we need to make it sort of, uh, we need to consider that when we consider the timeline because there has to be some long-term parking for that type of thing. Yeah. It's not always going to be short-term for cabs or Amazon. Or, you know, it's not necessarily always going to be that. And then even though you make it short-term, it doesn't mean it's available for long-term people. So we need to consider that going forward. Um, the one comment I had, I guess, when I was, when you were talking about it was going to go from, um, uh, the, the laneways were not accessible in that. I mean, the laneways were accessible in that block um, so that people could access that way. And that's why we, your, the permanent pipe cycling structure is being suggested. But I, I know it's only a period of time, but still, um, when I, we don't plow laneways. So in the middle of winter, in the worst weather, for mobility as well as just weather. Um, we're not doing much to help those people out if we're gonna say, okay, you've got to use your lane because we're not gonna plow it. Well, there's several blocks along the corridor that don't have laneway access. Mm -hmm. um, so the but people that- front, if they don't have a laneway, except for the Northern mm -hmm. part of 29th, where some of them have- the road gets had, plowed. Had front and they had laneway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there's no, no parking on some blocks. There's too many driveways for parking pockets, and there's also no laneway. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, but the point is, you can get into your driveway if you're coming from the road because the road is plowed. But if you're only accessible from a lane, you don't plow it. You can't actually get into your parking spot in the rear because we don't have a service to plow the lane. So there, you know. Well, the lane's got to be paved first of all, and we don't plow lanes currently. The lane is going to be paved. No, the lane has to be paved. All lanes have to be plowed. paved. Um, yeah, and the well, residents yeah. would have to pay for that. That's yeah. an obvious. Yeah, yeah. Well, I assumed we were going. State there. the obvious, <laughs> and then uh, of course, council's well aware we don't have a service level where plows lanes at this time. But that's a local improvement area, so the residents would have to plow or pay for the building of the lane. Right. 
We are not just going to go do that. Oh. Okay. All right. Councillor Ma as well. Can yeah. I just want to last thing? Yeah. <coughs> barriers when you show Lynn Valley Road. When I first drove that, and I had a lot of people contact me about this, but as you get used to it, you know what to expect. But a lot of people commented that number one, because of the slope of the cement barrier, they almost ran up on them. Number two, the signage is a bit back on the barrier. Does the signage be at the front of the barrier? For more people sooner? Well, um, what we did is we did, you can kind of see it in these photos here is we've added um, some like high visibility reflectors on the on the yeah. what we call the bullnose of the yeah. barrier. Yeah. Um, the, the sign is mounted, um, it's drilled through the it's like a saddle mount. And so but is there a reason why it's so far back that it couldn't be more present sooner? Just wondering. Um, I can I can talk to some of the staff to see if there's a different way of mounting signs. Um, but we felt that with the reflectors that you know they're they're pretty visible like driving the corridor. Uh, you drive it at night, it, it, there's, there's a lot of reflectors and signage for every barrier piece. So I just think the sooner we can warn people if we're gonna put signage up, the better. Okay. That's all. Thank you. Councillor Mont. Yeah. On those points, I, I wanted to follow up on this barrier assembly. And from your earlier comment, uh, you mentioned that, you know, practices are evolving as we move to better practices. So these concrete barrier assemblies are an improvement over the delineators right now? Well, I would say, given the, uh, the, the, the range of needs required along the it's, I think it's a, an optimal solution. Do you have any information in terms of whether they provide more safety, like uh, reduce accident? Because, you know, a concrete barrier would probably be more likely to stop a car sliding into a bike as opposed to a plastic delineator. I'm just seeing if there's additional benefit to having this. Um, I would say that there's, Probably there's a lot of um, uh, documentation and, and research done on the benefit of physically separating um, uh, bike lanes from travel lanes. Now, whether it's specifically looked at this type of assembly and this length of barrier, um, I don't think so. Um, but I think that um, you know, when placed in the higher conflict zones, um, you know, for example, like when you're approaching intersections. Um, that you know the, the, the barrier definitely brings you know more awareness and you know, protection to those using that. That's uh, Another consideration also is maybe this, you know a flexible delineator that's mm -hmm. going to break a lot easier if a car hits it. Concrete is going to take a little bit more for it to get impacted. So from a maintenance perspective, uh, but the concrete piece maybe I don't have information at hand, but anecdotally, yeah, it could be better from a maintenance perspective. I, I would just think that it's safer, but they're not as, um, there's not as many of them as the uh, plastic delineators, but yeah. yeah and again, we're uh, limited by the space between drivers, right? Um, and of course the gap would need to be wider than the width of the driveway just to allow for the turning. Uh, because if you tighten it too right. close, then right. it, you know, then it could be a, a hazard itself. Um, but as I mentioned, the nice thing about these is that they are flexible. So if we find that, you know, we want to um, really ex extend these as much as possible while adhering to the, you know, the, the needs of the other you know, driveways and solid waste and, and so forth and uh, bus stops. And, um, you know, we, we, we can do that. In terms of just looking at cost, I know uh, Gavin estimated that removing the delineator could cost up to about $50,000. I don't recall, but I'll take your word for it. Yeah, that was, that was me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I saw it in the email. Um, what cost 50000 uh, it's, it's an estimate to remove all the delineate, delineator posts and to put in the, uh, the barrier assemblies. Okay. Plastic delineators cost $50,000 to remove? And, and to uh, install and these. And put in the concrete. And, and put in there. <laughs> sorry. Uh, 
Uh, I've got, uh, um, Sorry. I just want to finish off. Um, <clears throat> the parking pockets and these uh, concrete assemblies are two separate things. We can have the pockets for both. I'll go unscrew them for 10. <laughs> 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 you have a snow plow can take care of it. I'm gonna it have their back back of <laughs> I kind of think we got to like sink. We can know, get some right. of the neighbors to run them over. <laughs> All right, Councillor Hans. Councillor Hans, your comments. Yeah, hi there. I'm coming back to this issue of uh, snow plow and the lane because that seemed. I walked the whole perimeter of the area a number of times, and that lane seems like quite a critical access for a number of the properties. Not some only way? access. It's only access, yeah. Is there not some way we can uh, pave the lane and plow? Sure that right. they get. That Councillor Hanson. Uh, he wants me to help him. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, I raised that issue because that, uh, uh, I mean, the parking par pockets solution, I, I understand. Uh, the, the logic of it, and I, I appreciate that it serves some purpose for some of the residents, but uh, there is that whole group that are uh, not serviced if we have a heavy snowfall uh, and the lane. Just coming back to the issue of cost, so the $250,000 figure is put forward. Um, can you uh, tell us a little bit about how that's distributed amongst the different items of this uh, project? and how confident you are of that figure versus some higher figure that might uh, end up occurring due to cost overruns in the construction process. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, we do have a preliminary design for it. So the, the, the cost estimate is based on a design. Uh, and the estimate is approximately 80,000 for the smaller north side parking pocket and approximately another 20,000 for the south side parking pocket. And then the 50k for the removal of the posts and the installation of the concrete uh, barrier assemblies. And so this is a uh, this would include all engineering, project management, contingency uh, costs as well. Um, there is a chance that the, you know cost could come in less than 250,000. Um, but uh, you know we feel that 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 number uh, would ensure that you know we'd be able to deliver. These items. First, first, fifty thousand for the post barriers. How, what was the distribution between the uh, three spaces and five spaces? Uh, about eighty and one twenty. So eighty thousand for the smaller parking pocket, and about one twenty for the larger. So it's um, forty. What is that? What two? Two fifty. I'm just dividing it by the number of spaces. It's uh, we're getting two to three, five to six. A um, Let's say we're getting uh, eight spaces for two hundred thousand dollars, forty thousand space. Do you, do you have any comments on that costing? Is that uh, what we could expect, or does it? It's, it's, it seems like a lot of money for uh, uh, the parking spaces to me, but I know that's only. Maybe explain, <laughs> Councillor Hampton. Maybe explain, Mr. Carney what you're gonna do in order to achieve these parking spaces. You're gonna take some real estate out of the bowl of water, will you not? Well, the space is available within the existing right of way. So it doesn't- The right of way on the boulevard. So there's gonna be some front part of the boulevard from the curb to the property line being taken out. Yeah. So yes, it exists within the right of way. But explain what that means. Let me take a shot at that. Yeah. 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 It's uh, the cost to amaze me, but it's always the smaller projects. So you think about all the people we have on this job. We have somebody come and do the excavation. We have somebody come back in and place a gravel bed. We have somebody that comes back in to pour concrete curb and gutter. We have somebody that comes back in to pave the asphalt. You have flagging, sign, and line control out there for multiple periods of this. Um, so it really adds up very quickly. It doesn't surprise me, and, and yet it does. Uh, from what I've seen, especially in the last year on tenders and the grids, the space comes from the boulevard in front of people's houses. Right. Right? So we're shortening yeah. shortening people's driveways in yeah. front. Yeah. Yeah. All tie-ins and small little, but yet you still require asphalt, then concrete, people, uh, gravel supply, uh, probably some uh, turf receding at the back of the properties where you've done the tie-ins. Yeah. On the north side, there's also a retaining wall. So these do these costs do uh, do add up. Um, I will just uh, 
mentioned that there are big, the reason we can do the parking lots here is that the, there, there are no driveways. So I mean, the picture gives you a very good indication of what you can see. Okay, I, the, the floor is Councillor Hanson's, then I've got Councillor Mary and Councillor Pope wanting to speak as well. Council I'll, I'll yield to Councillor Mary. So there has been a request for funding put into the provincial government. Is that correct? Uh, through uh, MLA Chant. Yeah. Uh, I emailed her um, assistant and said that uh, I would get back to her following this workshop uh, as to whether or not direction is to, to move ahead with the parking lot. I've already put in a request. You did indicate that funding could be available. Yeah, I think they already requested it because there was a deadline. Um, yeah, so that's the, you know, that's, so, you know, when you look at the map, you know, when you look at the map, this section between St. Christopher's and Froham has lanes, you know, plowed lanes, problem one. Um, you know, the other side has a partial lane, it doesn't go all the way through, and then it doesn't come out anywhere at the end of the backyard. Um, so there's no parking really still from William down to St. Christopher's. Um, have the numbers gone up since 2020? Sorry, which numbers? Cycling numbers? Cycling numbers. numbers. By how, like, what's the percentage increase? No, not percentage, real numbers. Oh yeah, real numbers. Let's look at real numbers. So what are the real numbers that have gone up since uh, the spring of 2020, when you, which you put in your your uh, slides and today, what are the increases in those numbers? Uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, uh, although I can say I, my understanding or my recollection is that they range from about 35 per day to about 50 per day. I think 50 was the maximum from spring 2020. Given that we were in a, the beginning of a pandemic and, and everybody yeah, was at home. And some of it, you know, is a little bit weather dependent. Um, uh, but there was one year, it may have been 2021. I'm not sure which what season, uh, but what I recall one of the numbers was uh, average of 35. So it's actually dropped. It's fluctuating. It's fluctuating. Um, the, um, the time commitments of 30 minutes. I mean, we're not in, you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm of two opinions. I'm concerned about, you know, any spillover from um, any commercial operations school on, you know, further down the road, um, finding a space there, although maybe it's too far. Um, but I'm just wondering why 30 minutes? It's not in a commercial area. There's, I mean, there's businesses within houses, homes, that would require somebody to be there longer than 30 minutes. So I think if we're going to do this, we need to be able to give people a reasonable amount of time to park, to go in and get a service if they've got a home-based business or if there's a care worker going in. Um, I would like to know how we're going to address the family that actually can no longer allow their family members to visit because of the slope of their, um, or the fact that parking's been taken out of their front entry and they can't access the stairs in the rear entry of the home. We do have the name of that family um, and we do have their address. So I think we need to address that. I was wondering if the parking park pocket might address that. I, we no, know. I think it's it's further up the road and the further up the road between William and Christopher St. Christopher's is not going to be able to, there won't be any parking up there because of the number of driveways. Um, so um, I think we need to look at, all, I mean, we'll, we'll be able to look at that when we consult with the residents on this. But I think it's important for the residents to know this is taking out part of you know, the boulevard and the boulevard is eight feet from the curb in your property line. Um, so that's the part the district uh, can access if they so wish at your expense. Um, and, uh, and I guess I've already spoken about the, uh, the fact that we need to look at that lane. You know, I mean, I, you know, I go back to, we, we put this thing in um, and the intention was to put one side in and to collect data. And we didn't do that. We put both sides in. I understand the need for protective bike lanes, um, you know, and wanting to increase the mode share, increase, uh, you know, the feeling of safety in these areas that are busy, um, you know, but we need to find a middle ground and I hope we're gonna get there with this solution. It's just too bad that one block that has a lane gets parking, even though they can't access it in the winter and then another block gets, you know, there's no on-street parking. 
So. Um, can I just, uh, before I go to Councilor Pope, can I just address something Councilor Mary just raised there? Sorry, if you get direction from the council tonight, are you going to a consultation process with the community over these changes? Or this is, this is you're seeking, because the, the recommendations look like you're seeking direction to go and yeah. do something right away. So let's we, be clear about that. Well, we'll, search, we'll seek council's direction on that. But to, to be blunt about it, uh, I'm not sure going to consultation in front of residents where we're asking for parking bays is going to come back rather positively that front. So it's one of those street-based decisions versus the individual situation with the parking pockets. Certainly are going to show up and have a consultation with those residents, but we want to leave here with a direction from council that that's what our intent is. Well, I think that... But to host a meeting to, to decide that's not... It's it wouldn't be the consultation is an informed correct process. as opposed to true consultation asking. Yeah, yeah it's but you're going to go you're going to need to meet with all of those residents that are impacted one two three four five you know six seven eight to lots to say impact. this is what council wants to do based on you know the input of needing more parking and this is what it means but, but please be advised that it's eight feet foot closer to your front and door. you need to that's show them that we will communication has not been good in this process that's a that's significant why. movement towards their property line yeah, yeah. yes yeah, i would agree so i've got councillor pope followed by councillor back i see your virtual hand there's so councillor pope well, I have a number of thoughts. And first of all, I was kind of gobsmacked when you mentioned that this has been discussed since 2016. Consulted, engaged with, I cannot imagine the amount of money that the District of North Van has spent on consulting, engaging, coming up, our staff coming up with plans, putting them in, considering taking them out. And now we're on another council and we're being asked to look at it again. It's, you know why? No, I don't want to be interrupted right now. Thank you. But you need to understand why. So, so I would like to congratulate the staff on coming up with a brilliant solution <laughs> that I think is incredible, uh, given the short timeline and everything else. My problem is that it's $250,000. And in my opinion, it's $250,000 too much. Um, my feeling is, and what I heard in letters from most residents, was that it was an inconvenience to them to have their parking storage removed from 29th Street. And I'm sorry, but in this day and age, when we're trying to achieve our goals of the OCP and make our community healthier and our kids healthier and reduce traffic congestion and reduce uh, carbon emissions, this makes no sense to me. Um, I think that if there is to be uh, some form of this to come out, then we need to consider uh, reducing the number of parking pockets uh, to one or two. And th that is only for the people who have told us that they are experiencing hardship because I certainly don't think that anybody who wants their disabled son to come and visit them uh, should not have the accessibility to be able to do that. And now that I hear that the parking pockets aren't even, aren't even in the block uh, where that family lives, it's like, why are we doing this? To Why is the entire district of North Van being asked to pay for parking for a handful of people on 29th Street, street parking. Again, it makes no sense to me that this should come out of our budget. Um, but I'm prepared to understand that others here at the table feel that it's important for all of us to buck up and pay for those parking spots and those parking pockets, fine. As I said, I think we should reduce it to one or two spots on one side of the street so that people can get their pizzas delivered and their medical supplies dropped off. And uh, you have a question for staff at this and their mobile. Would you please say that to Lisa next time she goes on for five minutes? I'm just trying, I'm just so I'm almost finished. Thank you very much. 
I think that um, I'm sorry if it makes some people that's unhappy. Offensive. It's insulting. That's offensive. So that's why I'm. That, but that's that's, that's what I've heard. That's I've heard only. That's sorry, sorry. Excuse me. I've heard only one or two people who have written uh, this council sorry. to say that they've experienced friendship. The content of your of your comments was directed to minimize the impact on the neighbors, which I think is a bit insulting to the situation. That that's all I'm saying. I'm sorry if it seems insulting. It's just realistic. I don't mean to be insulting to anybody. I just want to make sure that people who have hardship are accommodated. But people who view the street as storage to park their cars, uh, we shouldn't have to pay $50,000 per parking spot or whatever number Jim Hansen came up. It's not disrespectful. It's just the reality of the financial situation we're in. Okay, I've got Councillor Back, your comments. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, first of all, um, I want to thank staff for listening to uh, all of the, the comments uh, that we've had over uh, the last meeting about this and, and tonight. Um, we're trying to deal with a lot of competing demands through this area. Um, and uh, I think you know, as, a, as somebody who rides a bike through this area quite a bit, um, I, I think adding concrete barriers is, is good. Um, I think it, it would be better if it was one continuous uh, concrete uh, separation, but obviously we can't do that with the number of uh, driveways. And as I say, we're trying to compete with a lot of different um, demands for this, this small area. Um, but I am generally supportive of, of using the concrete um, in the way that's proposed here, I think for, for solid waste, I think that that makes sense. But, um, you know, I, I totally agree with Councillor Pope, the cost uh, and, and Councillor Hansen's pointed it out, the cost of this uh, is, is not insignificant, a uh, quarter million dollars. When we look at the number of capital projects that uh, are at risk of being deferred from the next five years, um, a quarter million dollars would go a long way to uh, towards some of those projects. Um, so, you know, I, I guess I, I would be interested in, in whatever we can do to make sure that this, you know, re reinstating uh, parking onto what is public property, um, uh, that it's going to have the biggest impact for the people that need it the most. And um, I, I don't think it is for any kind of long term parking. I, I think, you know, from what I've what I've heard from the residents of 29th, it's it's those pick up and drop offs. It's a it's a loading zone type situation. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, the majority of whom can, can park in other areas that is, that is close by or, or park in their driveway. Um, the issue of, of, of the lanes and, and plowing the lanes, I, you know, I, I would be open to trying to figure out a way to, to do that. Uh, because obviously for a number of these residents, that is their main access to their home. Um, but, um, in terms of the parking pockets, I, I would just like to see, see us do what we can to, to bring the cost down. I, I I don't know that it's two parking pockets. You know, maybe it's maybe it's one. Um, and as I say, I think we really have to restrict it to uh, very short-term um, kind of loading zones. Uh, otherwise, we're just we're going to have people parking there and and you know leaving their cars. And that's I think not what we're trying to achieve here by by doing this. Okay, I've got uh, Councillor Forbes next. Did you have your hand up? I did. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, a comment back on what Councillor Back just said, and then I'll go back to what I was going to say is these projects are not deferred for five years. The deferrals we're looking at in the budget, and I repeat myself again, is for this annual budget that we'll be looking at. <clears throat> that means they can come up next in the next budget or the next four years. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Um, and I really, really, really want to get this clear. There's been a misconception by some people from the very beginning that this is about wanting on street parking, their own personal street parking. No, we're talking about deliveries. We're talking about Amazon. We're talking about cab pickups. We're talking about health care services where they have to stay longer. And I'm sorry, with all respect to the residents of 29th, um, 29th was built a long time ago. And a lot of people who live on 29th are the older demographic. 
mid, mid to older demographic that really need the accessibility that we'll need more and more because we're our, we're an aging we're aging on the North Shore. Uh, demographics are going up for the older age group, not for the younger age group. Hopefully, the younger one will go up at some point. Um, but those people are going to need health care services. If they don't need them now, they may need them in the future. So I'm not against, I, I keep saying this, but people want to misquote me. I'm for protected cycling lanes. That's the best thing for everybody. I don't want anybody to be in danger or their life taken. But at the same time, we talk about we're forcing people to lose um, some of the accessibility from some of the services they need. So we're forcing them to walk a few blocks. And I talked to a nurse who provides services there. And she said, I need longer parking. I need parking on 29th. If I park all the way around in Tempe Heights and then, and then get around, she said, I can't even find parking in Tempe Heights anymore. So what we've done is pushed this parking problem out. But that's not the main consideration of most of the 29th people that I talked to. And obviously we can all sit here and say, I heard this and I heard that, but I've been working with the people on 29th since uh, 2018 when I came into council. And I have the unique position of voting for the, the traffic to the parking to be removed. And I've changed my mind that we have to accommodate some parking on there. So I'm in that unique position and I think we need to be fair to our taxpayers. Don't assume they want it for a free public parking space that everybody else probably has. They need services, they need deliveries just like anybody else and they should be, their taxpayers, they should be treated equally as other taxpayers. Thank you. Councillor Mary, your comments? Um, I do think that we need to um, confirm that a submission has been requested to the provincial government for funding for this project after our last meeting when this item was deferred to a workshop. Uh, Eli Mallon came forward expressing um, a comment to several of us after the meeting that there was some money available in the surplus that the provincial government is holding and that um, MLI chant would, um, would could assist. I believe that that um, assist has been submitted already to the province um, because there was a deadline um, and uh, the deadline has passed. So um, I would ask Mr. Joyce to follow up with the office tomorrow and see where that is. So this discussion about the costs coming out of um, DNB taxpayers may not be a discussion, although there is only one taxpayer, so we're all gonna pay for it in the end anyway. Um, but I think it is important to just clarify that this, um, yes, has been going on since 2016, um, but the decision um, to go ahead with a cycling lane on 29th um, from a staff report submitted to council in the early parts of 2018, 2019, right? 2019, was that one lane of cycling uphill be put in and the other lane uh, remain to gather data and see how it worked. That was the consultation that took place with the local residents. And then it came as a surprise to them when uh, the council that was um, void of the mayor and myself voted in favor of putting bike lanes on both sides of 29th and removing all parking. And that is what started this very stressful back and forth with residents um, that had little, little option, especially during the winter time, to access their properties. And, um, and that's why myself um, and Councillor Forbes over the years have continued to communicate with them to try to find a solution. In my mind, the solution was to take away the downhill um, uh, bike lane, protect the uphill, um, and, uh, and return it to one side of parking. That has not been something that has been supported by council. So here we are today looking at this. I think it is important to note that the slide said there's about 50 riders a day, but that was in 2020 when we were all at home because a pandemic was declared. And uh, those numbers, according to Mr. Carney, although you don't have the exact figures in front of you, we're suggesting those numbers have dropped. 
um, down to 35, although it fluctuates, is that correct? Yeah, so the numbers have actually dropped. So my previous comments in the previous part of this uh, presentation was let's figure out where people are actually going. Are they actually going down William to Lynn Valley Road? Are there more riders going down William? Or are there more riders going along 29th or Shakespeare? And I don't think we know that. Um, and I think we should actually find out. Um, I don't know if we're worried about money and we have yet to find out whether or not um, we're going to be successful with this, this grant request from the surplus. Um, but maybe we, maybe we leave the delineators in for the time being. We've got a lot of other projects that we've got to look at. And I know that this is the model um, that you would like to use because indeed this um, design is the same as Lynn Valley Road. And I know that you would like to mirror that on this side of it, I get that. But you know what? Sometimes we can't have everything that we want. Um, and I think the residents of 29th um, understand that better than most. And I think the cycling community feels like they understand that as well because they want more protected bike lanes. Um, but you know we have to find that middle ground. Um, and so maybe we peel back a little bit. Um, I do think it is important to talk to those properties where this infrastructure will go if indeed council wants to go in this direction. And, um, and I do think that there needs to be some sort of um, funding available to look at the back, that back lane. Uh, I, I don't think that um, you, know, you can take from one and give to another. I, I just don't think that is, that is fair. Um, I, I think that we have to find a balance for both groups and not everybody gets what they want. And, and you know, not everybody has to give up stuff either. There has to be that, that middle ground. Um, so we've got to do better as we go forward and continue bike lane infrastructure and protected bike lanes. And I think what came out of this, for those that are new to this table, what came out of this process on 29th is why you have Lynn Valley the road the way it is. That's why, because we realized the shortcomings of what we did on 29th and we weren't gonna repeat it on Lynn Valley Road and we didn't. We've got parking pockets, we've got short-term parking, we've got longer-term parking, we've got areas that trucks can pull in and it's a bit of both. And it was it loved by all? Nope. Um, has it been opposed by the vast majority of the neighborhood? Nope, it's a middle ground and, it, and it's working. Um, unfortunately, 29th did not get that same treatment and that was unfortunate. And for that, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that we went down that, that road and we couldn't, we couldn't deal with it. So that's why it's gone on for so long because, uh, um, you know, I, I want to continue to try to find solutions for all people. Um, I don't want to just leave it because, you know, it is what it is. I want to try to find some solution. I think it's the majority of us do and that's why we're here today. Councilor Back, I see your virtual hand up. Is that from before? Yeah, that's from before. Sorry. Okay. Councilor Hansen, you had a comment? Well, can I, I'm, I'm going to make a comment with respect to the uh, proposal that's before us. Uh, I, I do, notwithstanding the fact that I'm concerned with the cost, and that's been uh, mentioned, uh, I do support this proposal. I support the parking uh, park uh, parking pocket proposal. I also uh, support the concrete barriers uh, proposal. From my point of view, this fits in with a great many decisions that come before us. Uh, they're difficult decisions, and we have to balance uh, difficult issues. And from my point of view, a great place to begin that analysis is with respect uh, for the different competing interests and the different points of view. Um, in my view, and, and I've been involved in this particular issue right from the very beginning. I remember walking it uh, way back, I think in must have been um, 2018, uh, that we first uh, were introduced to the issue. And I, I remember becoming aware of the, the parking issue, but also I have consistently voted in favor of, of the bike lane uh, that this represents on both sides. So I, I'm not comfortable with the $250,000. However, I think it represents a compromise. This is a compromise. And it's a, an attempt to find uh, a path that is reasonable, that accommodates the existing cycling infrastructure, but at the same time 
and provide some uh, mitigation to those that are affected by the parking issues. Um, I remain concerned about the lane uh, that because th this only provides a certain amount of uh, support to the residents with, with, with the lane is also critical. Um, I agree that we need to find uh, contributions from the provincial government. That's always a good idea. And we'll perhaps have some effect of reducing that $250,000 to a number that uh, perhaps is less. And um, uh, so I'll, I'll leave it at that, at that except to say that uh, from my point of view, uh, it's, it's not perfect. Very few decisions uh, can be. It doesn't uh, perfectly address anybody's needs, but I think is a reasonable compromise reasonable step for this council to take uh, given the steps that have led us here. Councilor Moss? I'll just break out some thoughts. Um, Councilor Hanson, I, I concur with you on a lot of points. I too want to support connected bike lanes. I too want to see if we can address the accessibility concerns of some of the residents same time, I'm concerned about the costs and the implications of our decision here on other bike infrastructure that's going to be necessary in the rest of the district. I had a discussion just briefly with uh, Gavin earlier. You know, the 250 is a lot. Is there ways that that could be? scale back, but still meet some of the accessibility issues. You know, do we need both sides? Do we need the eight spots? You know, so I support the compromise, but whether to the degree that's being proposed, that's that's my question. And I think uh, Steve said earlier, we don't necessarily need the concrete barriers. I agree that they provide more protection, but until we solve some of the other challenges we have with the budget, I find it hard to, you know, in 50 right now. So. I agree with what Councillor Ma has said and Councillor McPasson have said about the need for compromise. Um, and it is difficult. Um, I have a couple of more questions for staff, one of which is, how did you arrive at the, um, the number of parking spaces in the parking pockets? I mean, it's, not, it's the maximum number that can fit in between driveway constraints. That's the maximum number for both sides. Yeah, okay. And so was that, that number wasn't based on any kind of there's no formula for assessment of no, need or something. It's just based available between existing driveways. Right. Okay. So it could feasibly redu be reduced at a reduced cost. Like, yes. I think that you've, um, I don't have that right in front of me, but I think you've um, detailed the fact that it would be $80,000 for two spots or three, two or three spots on one side. So that's to me is another compromise position um, that would make it much more palatable, I think, for taxpayers. I was also curious about the delineators. Will they, does this plan enable them to go to the very end still at the corner? I mean, from the concrete barrier to the corner, because that is one of the number one things I hear from the cycling community is that it, it is it people turn off the lane. I know yeah. you know what I'm talking yeah. about, right? And into the cycling lane when there's not a delineator right up to the right up to the curb. Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the, the concrete barriers can go very close to the intersection to prevent oh, right turners from cutting across and endangering cyclists, waiting at a red light, for example. Right. Um, the delineator posts currently go very close to the intersections. And so we wouldn't, we're not proposing a combination of the two. Um, it's really, you know, I think, you know, we think we have a better mousetrap in the sense that it better enables the solid waste collection, yet still provides the uh, cyclist protection in those high conflict zones, um, like primarily around the intersections. Um, 
And so really that's the proposal is to, to do a full swap out of the, the plastic flexible posts, the delineator posts for the, the concrete barriers. Okay. Um, and my one other comment was about the, um, which uh, Councillor Hanson uh, also mentioned, or I'm sorry, Councillor Ma also ha mentioned, which is about the precedent setting nature of um, providing parking pockets to people who complain uh, that live in the houses beside bike lanes. And um, because we are going to be increasing the number of bike lanes throughout the district, and if we have to start coughing up $250,000 every time one block doesn't like some bike lanes, um, it's, it, the cost is going to be exorbitant for taxpayers. Um, and in that regard, I you know, was noting that neighbors in one of our other um, streets on Donegal Place wanted speed humps, wanted traffic calming measures. And um, actually what, that, what those neighbors did was come up with a petition. The majority of people signed off on it saying, we want these and we'll pay for them. And so they did pay for them. And we agreed to that as a district. And I think that there should be potentially some cost sharing. Um, if we do go the pocket parking route, there, I, I think there should be some, some sort of cost sharing mechanism investigated, um, if not for this project, for, for future projects. I have one other thing, but I can't quite remember what it was. Can we get staff just to clarify the costs of like the $250,000 hit versus when we design a bike lane like Lynn Valley Road, for instance, it's sort of a project that we're looking at and it, it comes with a whole suite of improvements and changes. Like we're not going to be asking for $250,000 for, well, but it's a cost of doing the whole lane though. So we're either, so it's either council needs to decide whether you want to continue on with the model that's Lynn Valley Road, or you just want to wipe out all parking on all roads and just put in bike lanes. So I don't know that. Um, but I just based on Councillor Pope's comments. But they what the cost will be in this instance. That's what we're talking about. I, I understand a that. discussion about whether um, uh, we have an obligation in future, whether this is precedent setting, as Councillor uh, Ma mentioned, or not. I mean, um, plus also, I mean, big portions of the Lynn Valley Road section will acknowledge the, the cars actually do access off of side routes. And so it's, it's a different it's impact. A different roadway. And, uh, and in areas that have gone, undergone um, redevelopment with uh, higher density forms of housing. Uh, quite often, they're accessing off a route off of a side street as well. And they've got um, underground parking, and, uh, or they have a, if they have underground parking. And so, it's going to be case by case to some degree based on uh, the road widths that we have available to us, and um, and whether or not it's chopped up by a bunch of driveways. Um, so I, I don't know that there's going to be anything that's that's entirely precedent setting about this, uh, but. Um, I, I get the point. It just uh, it's going to depend on the neighborhood and the makeup of the, the boulevard space we have left available to us. Um, I have Councillor Back. You're going to I, I wasn't quite finished. Oh, um, so I'm just worried about this one family that we did hear from the, with the disabled son who couldn't get access. Like, what can we do for them to help them? Is there anything in this plan that uh, Mr. Carney, uh, <laughs> with that uh, stream, I actually haven't finished the presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sorry. I think you've seen the content of the presentation, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I do have a slide. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, where are we here? So, we talked about side street loading zones. This came up. We talked about it in the previous report. Um, not recommended for a number of reasons uh, listed here. The, the, the slide that I wanted to bring up was this one uh, that talks about uh, laneway extensions. And 
Um, so we, we did, and this is, again, this was captured in a previous report to council on, on this topic. Um, we did look at this um, and due to the cost of, it's not recommended due to the cost of, of construction and also the impacts to trees. Um, it's about 350 meters from the end of the laneway, which is roughly here, uh, to, to this piece of right away that connects up to Ross Road. Um, and at the current rate of construction, um, this is probably a one and a half million dollar job. So this is considerably more than parking pocket. So not to mention there's probably 10 to 15 um, mature trees through this, uh, through this right away. So, so not recommended. Um, again, you know, this corridor is, it's, it's, it's difficult just given the number of driveways uh, that we have. So parking pockets are simply not possible in many locations. Uh, we've really identified the two only feasible locations there. And, and those happen to be, um, sorry, those happen to be, this is St. Christopher's, Rome. So it's the, the smaller one is here and the larger one is, is here. And this is where we have laneway access on both sides. Um, so yeah, we have limited limited options. I think the parking pocket is is probably from a technical perspective, the, the best solution, but yes, there's a, you know, there's a cost to it. And that concludes, that concludes my presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. So these are the recommendations that you've, you've found in the report. Um, and the recommendations are that we construct the parking pockets and we swap out the posts for the, uh, the barrier assemblies and that the, the loading zones, the side street loading zones and the lane extension. But uh, Councillor Back. I just still didn't get an answer to my question. Sorry, what was the question? Um, about the, the family that's not on that particular block that expressed their concern about their accessibility issues. Mr. Carney? Which, sorry, which block are they on? Um, are they, are do you they, know, Lisa, which block? Well, they? I'm just looking at Peter. So there's two. There's, yeah, one's in the city. Yeah. Uh, there's a family on the north side that their mother uh, does rely on. Front entrance. Side, uh, just she would be served so by the pocket. So this, this would answer. Yeah, would it would help her. Can you, can you go back to the slide where the pockets are? Are you saying that is in the Yes. Okay. There's one other family, but it's, it's in the city. Oh, okay. Well, I guess we. There's one. There's one, yeah, and the other one's in the city, so. That's the city's party. The city didn't finish theirs. City hasn't done. May I go to Councillor back now? All right, Councillor Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Your Worship. I just wanted to um, reiterate my position based on some of the last uh, comments I've heard from, from Council. Um, I do support the parking pockets. My concern, just like the majority of Council, is the cost at, at $250,000, um, I believe, represents a quarter percent tax increase. A million dollars is 1%, right? Oh, right. Roughly, so a quarter percent tax increase across the district, across all taxpayers to pay for this. So uh, I think it is significant, and anything we can do to reduce that, um, you know, if it's looking at one parking pocket, uh, and and I don't, again, the delineators, I, I would be happy with them staying in place uh, and holding off on the concrete um, barriers at this point. Um, if if it's going to mean saving fifty thousand um, dollars, but yeah, I you know I, I am supportive and I appreciate that staff have done what they can to try and accommodate all of the competing demands in this in this area um, and while while keeping the bike lane. Um, so uh, I am supportive, just anything we can do to bring the cost down. Okay, Councillor reports. Uh, can I just confirm sort of, I'm confused. This is, these are recommendations. If this council here being asked for a decision on these recommendations, or is that gonna come up in a council meeting? Because we usually yeah. don't vote here yeah. we've said like that I so many times that 
it keeps Mr. happening. Jones, we, we did refer it here specifically to try to reach a consensus. That was the challenge we had in the regular meeting. Mr. Joyce, do you have additional? Uh, yeah, I think it served its purpose. We took it out of the regular meeting as a workshop to hear exactly this feedback. There seems to be some consensus around the room for the, uh, for the parking pockets. What I'm hearing though is we need to go away between now when it comes back to council for the vote for some clarity around the cost. We'll make contact with the provincial government before that time. And I think through the team, we can dive a little deeper into the two sides and narrow that down with you. We also have an existing infrastructure contract that I can manage from there to get some closer cost to actual costs and include that when we bring it back. And give some information to those property owners as well. And I would prefer to get direction from council on that before we start the property owners, so you might be back in, but uh, we'll and see possibilities of the lanes. Well, the lanes falls under a local improvement. The lane opening is a process we have. So it has to be sort of. And it's paid for by. User, user pay. You know, it's paid for. Unless we business. cause the chaos and then we should just pay. Yeah. That's, That's a good carrot. And That's to Councillor Pope's comment, we do have parking Bay, Strathcona, put some in on Bronte, my neighborhood, but they're local, it's called local improvement. Yeah. And so that the property owners benefit from that directly. And so they pay for that as a portion of the, the street. So the mayor's comment with the bike on arterials is slightly different. Greater community group, uh, community good, I would suggest. Community uh, uh, from town center to town center. So there's certainly a, a case that the entire community. That's also another discussion council can have. So you could potentially come back to us and say, you know, if you want one parking pocket, this is option A to vote yes to. If you want, and it'll cost you $50,000. Yeah, or you could do. I wouldn't. It is construction, so I'm not going to get down <laughs> to parking stall by stall. Right. Um, that's what it's kind of become. But I would. You know, we we could do one side or the other side. To Mr. Carney's point here, if you're in there, you may as well get the most you can. Yeah. Driveway. That makes sense. So what's it going to cost for one side to the other side, and whether council wants to do both or one, I think we'd come back and have a better clarity on the cost and whether the provincial government's in or out on the costs. Well, we've got. Yeah, I, I think the only way you're going to be able to get consensus from what I've heard around the table so far, and I haven't even shared my comments on that, <laughs> is that um, is getting people to agree on up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars towards the parking um, uh, spaces, and then subsequently having the discussion about you know different options under that. You've got you've got to move forward on something, um, and and this this is my problem. I mean, I. Uh, when we had the discussion initially, we did refer it to staff. Staff came back and told us exactly what we've said here tonight. We've already had the bulk of this information, although not done in the parking pocket format, but about you know, pullouts in the past that it was going to cost you about $30,000 per pullout stall in order to be able to do it. That was presented to the council a long time ago, 2019, most likely. Um, and so we've had, we've had those discussions before, and I still came back unsatisfied that for a four block section of shared lane that we were, that if we, if we took out the delineators and we, we made uh, it parking on the south side and then the driving lane uh, heading uh, towards the village in that section for a four block section became a shared lane, much like we have with shared bike lanes in a whole bunch of areas of the district. I get that it's not perfect, uh, but it's, it's what we use in a bunch of different areas. It's it's a legitimate tool in the toolbox. And so um, uh, we, we do use it. And so um, for me to come along and support $250,000 for, for parking, when I think there is a very simple, much cheaper option, which is to just reopen the parking on the south side and go to a shared lane for a four block section. Um, and I can't, bring myself to support exposing us to an additional $250,000 of costs in this, in this space, when I think that that is a, a, a reasonable tool available to us. And so then it becomes a, a question of how do we found a consensus? Um, I, I think I heard two people say that they'd support the $250,000 pockets. Four. I heard a third and a fourth say that they weren't willing to go up to 250. They'd talk about some uh, some version of that, um, maybe with a, a fewer number of parking spaces. Um, my view is the same view I've had all the way along here, which is that uh, I, I think that shared lanes is still a legitimate tool in the system. Um, uh, and so I don't know that we've 
received, we've, we've achieved one consensus. That's why I said at the outset of this, the only way you're going to be able to get a decision that moves forward is if the people who are in favor of the pocket lanes all <laughs> bandy together and support uh, some version of the pocket lanes and then, uh, and then you proceed from that point. But otherwise, I don't see us having reached a consensus here in the room over one particular option. So they could make, staff could make that another option, just that it goes back to four lanes but that's not the motion. Four blocks the, being a shared lane. With respect, the motion that brought us to this point so was by know. Councillor Murray. And Councillor Murray's motion brought through the council was that we um, we go back to not having um, a dedicated separated lane on the south side. And that was what, what the council decided to refer back to this meeting. And so that's really what we should be uh, focused on. I recognize though, the will of the room, room is what rules. And it sounds like the will of the room still doesn't have a consensus, but a majority of the room is leaning towards some measure of pocket parking in the stretch. Um, and so um, while I disagree with it, I think my job is to try to help you come to a consensus that you can move forward on, which is that, um, that the four members of the council agree to, um, uh, the pocket park, uh, pocket parking uh, proposal. Too, too much alliteration here, um, <laughs> uh, but that um, up, up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and up to eight parking stalls, and then and then you proceed back and have the, we, we all have the discussion about whether we end on the high end of that or on the low end of that. But I, I think that's the only way you're going to be able to get a decision that moves forward today. Councillor Forbes and followed by Councillor Mary. I just wanted to say, ideally, I supported, I worked with Councillor Murray on that motion. So ideally, I would like to say what you're saying, that the south side um, could be, just remove all of it and, and make the other side multi-use for that area, uh, multi-directional, I mean, uh, for that area, for the north side. Um, I don't think Council's going to go that route. The majority of council, um, but that would be my ideal thing. But the feedback I got on that, and maybe maybe I misunderstood from staff, was there were so many obstacles in order to widen the north bike lane, the present north bike lane, enough to make it bi-directional, and also the obstacles on the north side, whether it be posts or whatever driveway containing um, wall water services driveway all of that was going to make it astronomical compared to if we looked at pockets so ideally i'd like the south side opened my second choice would be pockets of some kind in order to get some sort of parking is that correct that's uh, correct i'll defer to mr kearney but walked it several times looked at the design elements there's only so much road space and latitude between property lines with power poles, retaining walls, and like. So this was our best compromise. Uh, what we thought would work to achieve what we could back. Apparently, the, to widen that to a bi-directional lane on the north side would be the same width as what's between Cap Road and Westview on the highway. Now, I haven't gone out on the highway myself and stood here and measured it, I don't want to um, But that's what I've been told, that it could be so it's the main reason the obstacles in the way. Yeah, the and, and so when we construct new, we have to be held to a standard as engineers. So that may be true, but it wouldn't be something you would build today. Okay. What we put in today, like anything else, construction of homes or like, updated to standards. So it would have to be certain widths of requirements, minimums to ensure safety and compliance. <clears throat> and what about the south side? Well, I've got Councillors Miri, then Councillor Pope, then Councillor Mo. Councillor Miri. Um, I'm. I counted four. I counted that Councillor Hansen supports it, although doesn't really love the price. If we could peel it back, then you would be supportive of the parking part or the parking, the parking box. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You got four Pockets. times. You got three Jesus. times. <laughs> and then I support that. I'm hearing Councillor Forbes supports that, and I'm actually hearing uh, Councillor Back saying that he supports it too. And we'll take out the cement barriers because we can't have it your way right now or your way or your way. It's gotta be something that we peel back and we'll keep the delineators in for the time being. So that takes 50 grand off the budget. And then if we get any money from the provincial government, even if we were to get half, 
that would be a huge step in the right direction and that may even relay relieve your concerns um no <laughs> because well maybe later when i talk to you for three yeah. hours okay. and convince yeah. you then you'll, um, so I hear four, I don't hear two. I hear there is a consensus for putting um, parking uh, on 29th and uh, looking at the lane and peeling back that amount of money in any way we can. And so that's what I hear. Okay, well, I, I'm glad to come back to you for wording of a motion oh, to, uh, <laughs> to move that forward at least, but I, I do have other people who uh, had raised their hand um, I thought I hand over here to no Councillor Pope. It was just picking up on the issue of the widening for the four blocks of um, shared path. So you were totally focusing it on the north side. That wouldn't be possible. Is it possible on the south side, or is it the same? It, it's it's not recommended where we have driveway. So if, if you can imagine pulling out of your driveway and you've got cyclists oh, right. approaching from both yeah. directions. It's not something that most people would expect. It's, it's dangerous. It's simply not recommended. Um, I had to leave that there's a, a, a fatal flaw in terms of excuse the pun, uh, in terms of safety, and I wouldn't stand behind it. I think we may have a hard time finding an engineering industry willing to sign off on that design. Right. Okay. okay. I don't see any further speakers. Oh, sorry, Councilor Mo. Actually, this on uh, Councilor Murphy's point. I encourage Councilor Portman to actually fix in favor of the pockets not at the full cost. Is that right? Yes, if that's the six. position. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I heard that you didn't support it. I didn't support you it. Don't support 250. the budget. Well, we don't know. It might. Uh, so 50 off with not putting in the concrete barrier. <laughs> Okay, is that all I had to okay, move so you, 50,000? But still, in order, in order to advance the discussion at this point today, then you know, uh, the clerk is just going over wording with uh, Council Mary. So just uh, on the Council uh, report uh, 3.1, so we'll move uh, item one, that staff deliver parking pocket solutions on both the north and south sides of East 29th Street that retain the existing cycling and sidewalk facilities while addressing accessibility needs of adjacent residents and that staff are to allocate a capital budget for these works in the 2023 financial planning process and um, that staff uh, communicate with the provincial government and communicate with the affected residents of these parking parking pockets to see if they might be willing to pay for some of the cost no but i, I so move I second. Thank okay. you. That's minus the concrete. Yeah, we're taking those out. Number two is recommendation. I still think that there's definitely a missing consultation piece because you're going to have I just put to take in off there the eight feet of the front of. I, the, I put the in there a consultation. Did you not hear? Okay. That they were going to communicate with the residents and talk to them. You need to do that. We need to consult. Absolutely. Thank you. But, but when? Inform. But it's an informed. Yeah. Well, again, okay. so this is the workshop. That recommendation will go back to, go council. to council. It's approved. Staff will very quickly make contact with those individuals, tell them what council's intention is through this process, and we'll start that. What we can do, like we we do this in other areas, and then we look at talks about mitigation and how it works and timing, and and just try to work with them. But this, the intent is that the work does get done. We're not offering them the fact that the work doesn't get done. It's how the work gets done, and work with them around that work. Okay. Um. I'm just wondering if that motion. Uh, it was seconded by Councillor Hanson. So we're, we're good to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if that motion includes um, the options to come back to us with the lesser number of parking pockets. No. Oh. No, I'm not. See, that was that the, the only way that I was feeling that we and could. You can vote. vote against. No, but, but I feel somewhat hijacked here because it's like. The reason that we were in favor of it is because we thought that there would be all these reductions in the costs. If it's going to be two hundred fifty thousand dollars that we're going to pay for six parking spots, well, actually, we're actually at two hundred thousand now because we've just shaved off fifty grand because we're not removing the delineators. 
So that's a $50,000 savings. And then we do not know what the update is from the provincial government. The deadline was January 20th, so it's February 6th today. So what's wrong with reducing the number of parking pockets to save taxpayers money? This is this is the motion that is on the floor and, and seconded. Has been seconded. It'll be tested. If it doesn't reach uh, a consensus of majority of council, uh, then a different motion yeah. can follow. But right now, this is the motion that's on the floor and seconded. And I propose discussion. an amendment. Uh, if it's friendly, uh, I would say that that that's <laughs> well. Yeah, if it's friendly, <laughs> we'll just say no. <laughs> so I would say that was a friendly amendment. That the specific. I'm, and I'm assuming some things here, but I, I'm assuming if you want to make it more towards what you were suggesting, that that would materially change the motion that's currently on the floor um, for consideration. And so I wouldn't hear it as an amendment. Uh, it would be out of order as an amendment, but it would be perfectly in line as a follow-up motion if they're not successful at getting a quorum, a, a consensus of council. So let's take a vote. Excuse me, it doesn't materially change the motion. It only changes the amount of the detail of the parking pockets. None of the rest of it is changed. It's, uh, if I may, um, Your Worship, um, I, I believe the, the, His Worship may be correct in that Clause 1 states that staff deliver parking pocket solutions. And then uh, the next clause, staff allocate a capital budget for those works. So I think to limit the funding would in turn limit Clause 1. <coughs> So I think the proposal, as I understand it, mean limit the spots. would be in conflict internally within the two clauses of the resolution. So it, it, deliver X. It will be tested as it is, and if it doesn't reach a consensus, then something different will, will come forward. Okay. So the motion is on the floor. It's been moved and seconded. Yeah, stated. Sure. And I just want to verify the last Can two. Can the clarification, Your Worship, before we do go to a vote on that? I'm just going to restate. Okay, please. What do you want? So we're all in agreement. Okay, that staff deliver parking pocket solutions on both the north and south sides of East 29th Street that retain the existing cycling and sidewalk facilities while addressing accessibility needs of adjacent residents. That staff are to allocate a capital budget for these works within the 2023 financial planning process. And correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Mary. And that staff investigate provincial funding. Yeah. Okay and that staff consult with affected neighbors. Yes. Mr. Joyce has a concern. And I might be able to sync with Councilor Muir here, more with Council Moore. I read that as we are preparing solutions, north side, south side, yeah. and what dollars come with potential solutions for the parking pockets. So there's more than one. Yeah, right? there's two. There's a north side and south side. Yeah, so like there's, laid there's a cost for north, there's a cost for south, and there's solutions with an S uh, to the parking pockets. All right? <coughs> When you come back to the council meeting for a discussion, you're going to present multiple, or is that at an additional later time? No, we would come back and say, we check with the provincial government. Here is uh, the whole cost we've achieved. We've said tonight, and I'm going to try to narrow that down to 250 and divide it into north and south for the cost of those. Okay. I don't know if that addresses your concerns, but. Uh, I don't know if you need to do that, but if uh, you want to. Councilor, back on the, motion on the floor. Well, so yeah, if that oh. that will come back to a regular meeting and we will be able to vote then on whether we want both north and south or just one or the other. Is that correct? That sounds like the engineer is prepared to present it at that meeting, yes. Correct. Okay. That's not yes, what my intention I really was. That's why I wanted to clarify. Yeah, that. I, th I don't think that was my intention that they were both being done because we need to have, I mean, we're talking about how many residences on 29th Street. So that if, you know, that's, I think, um, you know, you're just, like, what, why are you doing this? So you then know? I think we need a new motion, Your Worship. You, uh, present, you, you, presented, you presented your plan. We thought it was too expensive. We're taking 50 grand off for the cement, right? You're down to two. You might get half of it paid for by the province. Go talk to the residents affected. As we are, I think he's trying to point out that he thinks that the way that it's worded currently it actually expects that staff are going to respond with different options for north and south side we, of the we, road. We've made a recommendation. This stands as it, as it is, and I was just willing to come back and offer you some more clarity on the costing of the recommendation at this point in time, unless you give me. Well, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just totally reading what you wrote in your report, your own recommendation. I think it's the word in pockets, plural. 
and what that means to the council. I'm sorry to Parking make pocket solutions. 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 Well, you wrote that, not me. Yeah, I'm just, and again, <laughs> what, what you read into the solutions. That we're so really what, what staff intended by this recommendation is that we get a consensus on whether we're building a park, pocket park solution of some kind, and that when we would return to the regular meeting of council, they would present a, you know, a spectrum of different pocket pocket solutions. Well, that the intention of this motion is that it was the two that you laid out in your slides as presented, hence, or um, with removing the delineators to save the 50 grand and hopefully more. Mr. Stewart has emerged to to chart a path for to remove <laughs> the delineators. Mr. Stewart. You're muted, sir. Don't start. We just, we got it clear. I know. And I, I, I just suggest we record the minutes that council uh, identified a possible path forward with some options and that staff will come back uh, to a regular council meeting to get a final vote in the direction. I, I, I think, I, I think you're as close as you're going to get. It's not consensus, but the fact of the matter is you've spent two hours and 10 minutes. Um, Having a conversation and and whether it's about two hundred or two hundred fifty thousand dollars, I'm sorry, that's immaterial in the world yeah. of construction. Um, I, I think you've endorsed the idea of of uh, parking pockets, and we should just we should just move on, on honestly, and get back to a regular council meeting. Well, you know what? If we go and do a consultation with the community, which I understand there's a wish to do that, we are not going to get any more consensus than we do now, because the community is not in support. Of, of what's being done on 29th. That's the truth of it. And you're balancing bigger picture issues versus, you know, uh, 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 the local interests. I, I think we've got enough direction to uh, look at our costs, do some consultation, and come back to council for a formal direction. And we need to do that as opposed, I mean, this, this has been in front of council six times now. You know, at, at some point we just got to decide on what we're going to do and then live with it. So I'm, I'm comfortable with Councilor Murray's resolution. Uh, we will we will do the work that we have to and then come back to a regular council meeting because we don't do resolutions and workshops. What we do is recording the minutes uh, as to what the direction was or the consensus was. I'm not sure that there's consensus because there's a lot of conditions on what we've talked about. So let's just let's accept that as direction for staff to move forward and we'll be coming back. I have to come back with you probably before the summer break and say, okay, this is this is where we've landed. Yes or no. That's where we're at. Are you gonna are you gonna right. take a vote? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Isn't that what he just take a vote 45 minutes? <laughs> Isn't that what he just said though? Don't you know we don't need to take a vote? No uh, staff has enough direction from everything that's been said at this table to come back to us with their there's nothing wrong with us taking the vote in the meeting the, the the recommendation can be altered by a majority of council in the meeting it's just not committing us to anything except to say that staff are going to return with all of the yeah. things outlined which they specifically asked for yeah, yeah a, a vote a vote in a workshop is not binding a vote in council is. No, you're, you're correct. It is a, a, the, the vote is actually that the whole recommend to council. And so the wording includes that this is just a recommendation to move the matter at least forward to the regular meeting of council. No, that's what, that's what I'm suggesting, Your Worship. Thank you very much. I'm going to call the question. All those in favor, contrary minded, motion carries. Let's get Councillor Back. That was supposed Councilor to Back, be. sorry, you, you may have been delayed. Uh, you were in yeah. favor? I was okay, in favor of this so returning to a regular meeting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. The twenty million dollar questions are like done in like thirty seconds. All right. So I'm, the two hundred fifty thousand dollar ones take forever. I'll accept adjournment. So moved. Accepted. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, staff, for preparing the reports. And, Sorry, but are uh, we hearing from anybody? Uh, no, we can do it at the regular meeting of council. It's not a public hearing.